I haven't actually really thoroughly introduced myself in the sense of how did I end up being here? About 25 years ago, I read this book. I was a young man in Denmark. I was just turned 20, and this book was my epiphany. I realized I want to go to Britain. I want to study. So I read Liar's Poker uh, again. Where could I study? London School of Economics, etc., etc. I worked two jobs because back then there was no government support. So I, put, I took myself through two university degrees by my own velocity. But I was stinking lucky because in 1992, Britain was fighting a currency relationship they had called the European Exchange Rate Mechanism. And it was a dreadful, dreadful thing to be part of because it meant they had to protect their currency within a ban versus other European currencies. And I was incredibly lucky, ladies and gentlemen, because if I had walked down to the bank just a month earlier, I would have gotten nowhere near the amount of money that I did when I exchanged my Danish kroners into British pounds. And I more or less... It doesn't happen often, but I more or less caught the low. I made an extra 30% on my savings, which meant that I could afford to take a master's degree at University of Birmingham, where I studied money banking and finance. After which, I started working for JP Morgan. And for those of you who are the early sign-ups, I never traded for JP Morgan. I think it's very important to uh, make sure that, uh, you know, the, the saying is that uh, a lie can travel halfway around the world before truth gets out of bed. And I didn't want a knock-knock from J.P. Morgan saying, you never traded for us. I certainly, most certainly did not. I traded for myself, I traded for others, but I haven't traded for J.P. Morgan as much as I would have loved to trade for J.P. Morgan. I think I could have done a better job of some of them. <laughs> I worked for J.P. Morgan for three years, and then I became a home trader for 18 months. And ladies and gentlemen, you would have laughed at the way I traded. It was hilarious. I didn't actually have a computer. Do you know how I got my charts? Back then we had teletext. Do you, these, the older generation that are present here, do you remember teletext where we could get, it was like an early version of getting news on our mobile phones? Well, every third minute, teletext would update the quotes from the stock exchanges. So I sat there on the refresh button. Every third minute, I would write it down, and then I would actually chart it by hand until one day my brother took pity on me. He worked for IBM, and he said, I have a second-hand computer you can have here, and I finally got a computer. But it didn't last long. The result was predictable. Of course it was predictable. I was never going to make money trading on a tight budget. And 18 months later, I accepted a job at a company called Financial Spreads, later City Index. Over the next decade, I was a broker, an analyst, chief market strategist, until 2009 when I left and I've been trading for myself ever since. Practice makes perfect, except that it doesn't. And I believe this is the reason why people continue to lose, ladies and gentlemen. Because you can practice and practice and practice. You can do everything right. You can read all the books, take all the weekend courses, and still get nowhere in trading. Why? Because practice makes permanent. And there are literally thousands of trading books and millions of hours of web seminars that is supposed to help you trade well. But it doesn't. And all you are achieving by training the same way, is merely cementing your bad behavior. Okay. Now, I want to tell you a story that truly changed me as a person. Do you remember the story of Northern Rock? When I tell this story in Denmark, people don't know Northern Rock, but I imagine you guys know Northern Rock. What I found disturbing about Northern Rock was that when I worked at City Index, no one cared about Northern Rock. It had a base around 600 for a long time. And then in late 2005, it was as if it went on fire. And it rallied 50% from 700 to 1300. That's not even 50%. That won't do it. 80, 90%. But do you think that any of the City Index clients went on board this? No, they weren't. But it gets interesting because Northern Rock peaked, did a double top, 
and it then fell back. And then the curious things happened. No one had been interested in Northern Rock, but now they became interested in it. All of a sudden, people began to buy Northern Rock. Now, a broker doesn't ask a client, why do you buy Northern Rock? But they did. Now, my thinking is that they thought that Northern Rock had become cheap. I call it the supermarket mentality. And the supermarket mentality is a mentality that you see in investors, traders, scalpers, and anything in between. And it doesn't matter whether you're based here in the UK or you're perhaps based in Ukraine, where I gave this talk in Kiev. Now, I may not speak Russian, but I sure as hell know 11% off or 14% off. That's universal. And it could be in Holland, where I also gave a talk. And I might not be the best at Dutch, but I can see 35% off or halve price, which is half price. <laughs> yeah? It's universal. It appeals to us. You love a good bargain. You go down to the car dealer, and uh, he says, you know what? It's your lucky day. I'll, wipe. I'll give you an extra thousand for that thing that you call a car out there on the forecourt because it's you, and I feel generous. Yeah, sure. And you feel like, yay, I'm getting another thousand pounds for that. Was that a sign for me to stop? <laughs> it is universal. We all suffer from it. And I'm okay with it when I'm down in the supermarket. Quite all right. By all means, buy two chickens for the price of one chicken, or load up on butter ahead of Christmas. Please, if it's is it on offer? I'm, I'm the worst. I go down there and I'm thinking to myself, here I am, Saturday morning, you know, and I, oh my God, toilet paper is on offer. How many times have I come home with 16 rolls of toilet paper? You, you look at my cupboard, there's toilet paper for a fourth world war. <laughs> I can supply you all with, with toilet paper because I love a good bargain. And I laugh at myself. I literally walk around in the supermarket giggling at my behavior because here I am, a hard-nosed trader that would never buy something which is cheap. And there I am, like the worst of them. Hand soap is on offer? Ho, ho, ho! You know, you know that trick when you have the trolley and you take your arm in behind the shelf and you sort of scoop the whole thing out into the basket trolley? That's how I shop when it's on offer. Sadly... The financial market is a very different proposition. And what really affected me was a phone call that I received after that long thing there. It was Saturday morning and someone called me and said, hey, you gave a talk up here up north and um, I just wonder if I could have your opinion. My brother and I want to invest in Northern Rock because we think that it's a fantastic stock and it's probably a rare opportunity that is so cheap. Uh, what do you think about that? And I said, well, I'm not so sure it's a good idea. And there's two reasons for that. One, supermarket aside, that mentality doesn't work in the financial market. And secondly, let's say you do buy it here and it miraculously does turn around. You now forged a pathway in your mind that says, hey, Next time a really good stock comes along and it's fallen 66% from its peak, now might be a good time to buy as well. And you might get away with it the first time, you might get away with it the second time, but overall, you are playing Russian roulette, and sooner or later, you are going to get your head handed on a silver platter. Thank you very much. And I don't know, he probably went ahead and bought it anyway. But this is the story of Northern Rock, and it happened 100 meters from where we are today, approximately 12 years ago. People queuing up, and that picture is a fascinating picture, ladies and gentlemen. Why? Because the night before, the government had announced that no account depositor of Northern Rock would lose as much as a penny, yet even though the Government of all entities had guaranteed people's deposits. People still queued up. <laughs> well, if you don't trust the government to honor your, a, a, an IOU, who will you trust? It was pointless to queue up. It was a futile exercise. 
the money were guaranteed, but such is the power of fear. And it made an impression on me. And it, it leads me on to a story that I'm not particularly proud of telling because I think that the Me Too generation has done an incredible amount of, of work to uh, shine light on behavior by men that shouldn't be there. Nevertheless, in a much less il illuminous times, <clears throat> the father of modern economics, likened speculation to a beauty contest. He said, you will be presented by, in front of you, 30 beautiful ladies. And your job is not to say who is the prettiest. No, your job is to say, who do everyone else think is the prettiest and the second prettiest and the third prettiest? That was his premise for the financial markets. Our job is not necessarily to think about the markets in the context of what we think will happen, but to think about what do I think you think? What do I think you think and you think and you think? He called this once removed thinking. The idea of don't attack the market from the point of view of where do I think it's going to go? Think where do everyone else think it's going to go? He likened it to a beauty contest, where the job wasn't to select who you thought was the prettiest, but who you thought everyone else would think was the prettiest. Otherwise, you wouldn't win the competition where, in, in the newspaper where this was presented. Okay, so now we come to thinking in scenarios, and this is what I want to cover in the web seminar that we will be holding later on. It will probably be next week by now. I want to start off with a, a piece of analysis that I did a while ago. This is the statistics of the Dow Jones Index over the last seven and a half thousand trading days, or 30 years. What I find incredibly interesting is that this is the distribution of the losing days and the winning days. Now, when we started trading the Dow 30 years ago, the Dow was trading at 1,700. Today, it's trading at 29,000. So all However way you think about it, we have been through an, a, an amazing bull market over the last 30 years. Yet, the distribution of winning days and losing days in the Dow Jones is exactly 50-50. Over those 7,500 trading days, half of them were winning days and half of them were losing days. So for all this talk of technical analysis, when I come to work in the morning, I realize whether we're in a raving bull market or in a devastating bear market, the odds of a winning day or a losing day is 50-50. And it's, very, it's a sober thought because you go to work and you're thinking oh, anything can happen. Absolutely anything can happen. <clears throat> so what I would like to show you over the next 15, 20 minutes is to perhaps touch on the things that you had hoped I would touch on an hour and a half ago. And instead, I got well-traveled down the road of psychology. What you'll see is statistics for the last 256 trading days. And these are some of the questions that I have asked myself and answered. If Thursday is higher than Friday, then what does the following Monday look like? If I only traded extended bars on a scalp basis, how would I perform? Would I make money? Is there evidence to support that what Monday starts, Wednesday will continue? How often is the high or the low of the Dow Jones made in the first 30 minutes of trading? How often do gaps occur and how often are they filled? How often does a trend day occur? And if you don't know what a trend day is, you will. Are there any common denominations between strong trend days? Is there support for the comment that if you have a strong Friday, you'll have a strong Monday? If Tuesday is lower than Monday, then what does Wednesday look like? These are some of the questions that I have asked myself. And the reason why I ask myself those questions is because it gives me a roadmap of what I can expect. Doesn't necessarily mean it will happen exactly as I hoped, but it's an incredible guide into what I can expect. 
and it has been invaluable for my trading. Let's take an example. How often is Monday the high or the low of the week? Not a particularly interesting question because, frankly, I will only know until, uh, until Friday night whether Monday was the high of the week or the low of the week. But it actually happens that 60% of all trading weeks, Monday is the high of the week. Now, this information by itself is not particularly helpful. However, say you prepare for trading on a Thursday and you see that Monday so far is the highest day of the week. Could that piece of information help you when you are trading the Dow? And by the way, why am I so focused on the Dow? The fact of the matter, if the spread betting companies and the CFD companies were reporting what products were traded, you will find that Dow Jones is one of the most traded products. I happen to know a CEO of a spread betting company here in the UK who has stated for me that 90% of all their trades by volume and by stake size are executed in the Dow Jones index. Yes, wow, that's what I thought too. So let's take a look at it. The result I'll show you, they're manually tested. It means that I have printed out about 7,500 charts that I go through manually. Yes, it's... Uh, it's quite the library I have at home. <laughs> Maybe not everyone's idea of a library. I have asked myself this question. If Monday so far is the highest traded point for the last three days, i.e. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, then how often is Thursday going to trade below the low of Wednesday? I found that there was a total of 25 times when I was faced with this possibility. And out of those 25 times, Dow traded below the Wednesday low 21 out of those 25 times. To me, that's a significant piece of information. Let me show you some examples. Over here is Monday, then Tuesday, and then Wednesday, and then finally Thursday. Another example, Monday is the high. And by the time we get to Thursday, big move down. Even though it was a gap up. Another good example. And I will show you bad examples too. This is not a one-way street where I'm just trying to present the facts in a, in a biased way. No, I'll present it as is. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I call this scenario analysis, and I have never ever come across anyone dissecting the markets that they are trading in this manner. Let's carry on. If Thursday is higher than Friday, then what does Monday look like? Over the last two weeks, there were 21 instances where the price action on Friday was unable to trade above the highest point of the previous day, which was Thursday. I then looked at what happened on the following Monday. And if there was a holiday on the Monday, I would use the view the price action on the Tuesday. Considering the random nature of the markets, remember the random nature of the markets? Over the last 30 years, we've had 7,500 trading days. And out of those 7,500 trading days, half of them were winning days and half of them were losing days. That's random. Yet out of those 21 instances, what you're seeing here is Thursday and Friday and then the subsequent Monday. And you'll see that's a rather sizable gap. One more example, Thursday, Friday, and on the following chart, Monday. A very recent example from two weeks ago, Thursday, Friday, and then a big gap down on the Monday. Do you think I go home short on a Friday night? Of course I do. Have I sometimes got my head handed to me on a Monday morning when the market opened? Of course I have. But the stats are outrageously compelling. 20 out of 21 times, based on the last 252 trading days, 
based on the last 21 observations, the market has traded lower on the Monday. As my friend put it, he was rather minion-like. What? Yes. Gaps. How often do gaps? I've investigated every single gap since 2008. And I found that the odds of a gap being filled on the day is 58%. And here I'm talking about gaps more than 10 points. We're not, we're not caring about a gap of a five point. But any gap more than, than 10 points, there's a 58% chance that the gap will get filled on the day. So that you'll have to admit with me, that's kind of random. That's the kind of statistics that you're thinking, I can't really use that. But, but that's okay. Oh my God, ladies and gentlemen, I once investigated the tide in the Hudson River and correlated with the S&P 500 futures. It was an immensely interesting project, taking the tide table from the Hudson River, drawing it on a chart, and then correlating it with the S&P 500. Do you know what I found? There's absolutely no correlation between the tide in the Hudson River and the S&P 500 futures, but it was interesting. And I thought I was onto something there. And every now and then I thought, well, this is looking promising. But when I viewed the whole thing dispassionate, dispassionately, I came to the conclusion that there's absolutely zero correlation between the tide in the Hudson River. You may ask, how did you get onto such a crazy idea of the correlation of the, of the tide to the S&P 500? Well, you've heard the idea that the full moon will, will influence the water. And, you know, you've probably heard that notion of, well, lunar tech. You know, it comes from lunar, full moon. And <laughs> so the idea was thinking, well, hang on. If the moon can affect the waters to such an extent in the Hudson River, surely it must be able to affect us. No, it doesn't. I don't care. There has been, I actually studied this because I was quite curious, and this has got nothing to do with trading, but the evidence, the scientific evidence on the effect of the full moon on us, it is just rubbish. There's zero understanding, but that's the danger of, of half knowledge, half wisdom. So, well, you know, a nurse comes out, and that was a crazy night in this hospital. Oh my God, it's full moon. This is what we call an observational bias. So the next time, oh, that was a crazy night. But you're forgetting all the other nights that was absolutely quiet when it was full moon. <laughs> anyway, 58% doesn't really make a trend, does it? It's slightly biased to one side, but it's still pretty random. However, if I look at all the times when the gap is not filled on the day, I'm beginning to get something which is a little harder hitting evidence. I found that 78% of all gaps get filled at least within three days. So if you have an unfilled gap on day two and you're coming to, gap to, to day three, you're thinking, well, there's four chances out of five that we're going to fill this gap today. It doesn't mean that I necessarily take a position according, but it's good knowledge to have in your background. See, this is what I call awareness, just like the mayonnaise example. I'm aware that it is there. Oh. The higher the day and the lower of the day. No, I don't know if this is any interest to you, but when I trade, where I make my my biggest killings isn't when the market is having what we call a trend day. A trend day is defined by that the high of the day or the low of the day, not that I know it at that time, the high of the day or the low of the day occurs very early in the trading day. And by the time the market closes, the market has moved to the exact opposite. It closes near the high of the day or the low of the day. So you're virtually just having a one straight line all day or one straight line and I always play for that. That means it's very important for me to know what the odds are of the higher the day or the lower of the day being made early in the trading day. And would you believe it? Out of 100 trading days in the Dow Jones, 20 of those 100 trading days, the very first bar that you see at 2.30 in the afternoon when the Dow Jones open is going to be the higher the day or the lower of the day. I think that's quite interesting. I can see you share my absolute passion for that. <laughs> that's quite all right. I know it's getting late in the evening. 
But by 30 minutes into the trading session, or what I call bar seven, bar eight, there is now a 50% chance that we have already seen the high of the day or the low of the day. And by the time we are getting to an hour and a half, there's now a 70% chance that we have already seen the high of the day or the low of the day. And by the time that we hit the 18th bar, now there's 12 bars in an hour, so this would by definition be an hour and a half into the trading session, there's a 90% chance that we at that point have already seen the high of the day or the low of the day. We're going to play a game, and the game is just designed to trick you. I want to show you how feeble your minds are. And I don't mean that in any disrespectful way. I mean it as a, a fun way of concluding what to me has been a tremendous evening. I hope you share that. But it's also used to illustrate a very important point. And that is that if you leave that mind undetected, it will take you in any direction it wishes. So, this is what you're going to do. I'm going to show you a color. And I want you to call out. I'm going to show you a, a, um, a, a figure, I think is the right word I'm looking for. And I want you to, a shape, that was, sorry. I want to sh I'm going to show you a shape, and I want you to call out the color of the shape. Would you be okay with that? I'm not trying to humiliate anyone, embarrass anyone. In fact, I just think it's a fun way to finish a great evening. So here we go. Red. Yellow. A little bit more participation. Oh, you can just sort of mumble it in your own. That's quite all right. You don't have to be as loud as I am. It's quite okay. You can be, you can be, you know, this is a time now that, you know, this is not a Clint Eastwood movie. Now it's a time to, you know, liven up a little bit, feel the, you know, feel the atoms racing around. Green. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Blue. Blue. What? <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, well, you're forgiven here, but on my screen it's blue, but, you know, I'll live with it. I can accept that. You're, you're totally forgiven. Let's see what the next one is going to bring us. Yeah. Black. <laughs> Gray. Now we better, that means that we may have a problem on the next slide. So let's just do this again. Red. Yellow. Green. Blue. Black. Gray. Now I'm now going to do the same again. And I need your absolute participation. No cheating. No thinking. Just blurb out the first thought that comes into your head. Are you ready? Yep. Yes. Really? <laughs> to me, that's black. <laughs> Shall we start again? <laughs> we are talking red. We're talking yellow. Now I'm going to do it one more time. Are you ready? Yep. Good. Black. Good. Are you sure you're ready? Yeah. <laughs> I heard some yellows. Green, blue. Yeah, well done. Do you think you can do better second time around? Black. Red, blue, yellow, yellow green. Black. 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 I nearly said white myself. <laughs> that is the power of our mind. It will jump to conclusions. And when we sit and stare on those charts, it takes a very, very disciplined mind not to seek out the answer that you already think you want and actually be truly disciplined at looking at the charts, not be fooled by the mind's tendency to jump to conclusions.